Crystal Deal With It focuses on bridging the gap between where you're at now and where you'd like to be. We'll explore wisdom and techniques from a wide variety of domains and industries and apply them to your unique challenges. I love developing frameworks, processes, and storytelling metaphors that enable personal and business growth. Through actionable next steps, we'll build momentum and confidence. My goal is to help you clear roadblocks, do more with what you have, and realize the potential of yourself and your team. So throw your challenges my way, and Chris will deal with it. Episode 12, Mentoring Entry Levels While Achieving New Levels. Today's question covers what's often a difficult and crucial early career transition point. My employers hired several eager, entry-level employees for my department. Although I'm still early in my own career, they've assigned me to train and mentor them. Now I've been with the organization for four years and have a reputation for getting things done effectively. But what advice do you have on being an effective mentor while not sacrificing my own development? So before I dig into specific advice, an important comment for our asker is be sure you understand the assignment. Are you being assigned to simply teach a specific job responsibility or process? Simple training doesn't fall under the guise of mentorship. You know, if it is a simple training, the person being trained may admire and respect the way you go about it, could learn more about you and seek you out for more advice later, but let them lead that kind of request. Or to put it another way, you shouldn't force mentorship on someone. Now, if your employer is specifically asking you to be that new employee's go-to resource for growth within the company, awesome. This makes you a mentor. But you should still be staying within the confines of the company aspects that you're knowledgeable about. Uh, that can grow into something later, but realize that mentorship can take many forms, um, and you're never all in right at the start. With that being said, I've got five pieces of advice to give you some perspective. One, teaching elevates your learning. Two, invest in long-term relationships. Three, everyone has something to teach. Four, maintain balance. And five, meet people halfway. One, teaching elevates your learning. Teaching, quite simply, just helps you keep your developed skills sharp. I'll start with a great example. For me, you know, I was a TA for uh, one class in college as an ocean engineer, and I got to teach a class specifically on PID control systems. And this is a code that you would use in your thermostat to help keep the temperature controlled. It's a way of creating control curves for making it more of a gradual transition and, and being more efficient with the resources needed to maintain a consistent temperature. A little math, but I never forgotten the nuances of PID control systems because I had to really formulate an entire college level class around it. It's much more permanent in my memory because I had to display that knowledge, not just digest it for myself. Teaching helps you not just learn the material, but also it helps you not take the learning curves of your company's complex operations for granted. And it really focuses more on the sharing versus hoarding mindset. What's going to make us more valuable to our tribe, or in this case, to your company? Is it keeping everything to yourself and you're the only person that can do this task? Well, guess what? You might end up doing that task alone for the next 10 years because nobody else knows how to do it. And you, yeah, great. You do it really well. But what you want to be doing is train your replacements. Uh, then you could be more available to move up in the ranks within your company. But going back to teaching uh, and mentoring, Remember that when data is being input into their brains or output from your brains, it really isn't being processed. You do need to give them some time to digest what's being said. You're not going to say it, boom, everything's perfect, they understand, go. As an additional point here, you want to define a meaningful purpose for your leadership. What are you hoping to gain by teaching? You know, what, what's your, what are you passionate about that you want people to get better at? Likewise, you want to teach the why alongside the how. You know, here's why we do this, not just the A, B, C, D, and be done with it. I love this quote from Greg McEwen, live what you teach and notice how much you learn. So number two, investing in long-term relationships. You never want to view mentorship as a checkbox item on your to-do list. Mentorship evolves. It doesn't have easily definable end dates. I mean, no relationship has a clear development path, and mentorship is no different. And a good mentor has to earn trust first. And this looks different to each combination of unique people. And it's going to take time. There's no way to shortcut that. Level set your expectations around how mentorship evolves. Let it do that on its own time. And while relationships can certainly devolve, good mentorship experiences often evolve into close friendships or at least strong professional connections. If one of you moves on to a new organization, make it a point to stay in touch. 
You never know how or when paths are going to cross in the future. Your boss today could be your employee in the future. And if anyone had a crystal ball or a time machine, they wouldn't be wasting your time working for your organization. Right? They'd be making billions of dollars. So take solace in the fact that life is unpredictable. So it's better to treat our new and existing coworkers just like we treat any friend. Uh, there's a potentiality there that you just can't ignore. It's often easier to give or receive advice from someone outside the organization who also understands it in some capacity. And remember, the people you train or develop relationships with can become allies as they move on to different departments, business units, industries, com other companies. More generally, though, you want to give more time where it's received in gratitude. On the flip side, you want to make sure that you relay your own gratitude towards those who took you under their wing early on or those who are still giving you their time and wisdom. This doesn't have to be, nor should it be, grand gestures, gifts, whatever. I mean, people just love knowing that their experience, skills, time, and contributions are appreciated. It's deeply human. But forming good interpersonal relationships does require a certain degree of distance. You can't read a book if you push it right up against your face, nor if you hold it too far away. There has to be a proper distance that's going to help you read effectively. Uh, same thing goes with mentorship. No matter what sort of appeal your mentee might make, you are the only one who gets to decide what you should do. If you're at capacity or over leverage, it's okay to make the mentee fit their needs around your schedule. But it will take some flexibility on your part to give them that time and attention that they deserve as part of that relationship. But the reason I'm bringing up all these points is pretty simple. You just don't want to lose sight that this applies to those you mentor as much as it applies to yourself. Ultimately, it's up to them to do the work. And they're going to do it in their own way. Likewise, you've got to trust people's judgment, their ability to develop character in their own way. Another way you can view this or view relationships in general is are they vertical or horizontal? So a vertical relationship, they're hierarchical. I am above you in title, financially, in status, ability, connections, all of the above or, or individually. These relationships are highly driven by power dynamics, which can lead to the need to praise or to feel you need to receive praise in order to validate yourself. These types of relationships can often lead to feelings of inferiority or even worse, superiority. You owe me for having taught you this. We tend to treat many of our interpersonal relationships as vertical, often without even noticing or unintentionally. This could lead to passive-aggressive stances, feelings of unfairness, but it's just good to be aware that those type of hierarchical relationships do exist. There are horizontal relationships. They're equal but not the same for all people. These tend to be more collaborative, focused on mutually beneficial outcomes. And if we can build more of these types of relationships, there's no longer going to be any room for inferiority complexes to emerge. I mean, listen, both types of relationships exist in our society, and your company is going to be no different. Everyone's going to view relationships in different contexts. But powerful mentors recognize that they are not in a position of power, that they're not better than their mentee, that we're all just helping each other through our lives' journeys, which is a perfect segue into my next point, number three. Everyone has something to teach. You likely haven't ever received training on how to manage people. You probably won't going forward. And here's a secret. Very few of us ever do, including your managers. There is no playbook out there. The onus is on you to learn. Get a mentor with strong leadership qualities and or read some books on the topic. And now there are near infinite resources on the topic of leadership. You, know, you can go down a YouTube rabbit hole. There's probably 100,000 books out there. But personally, I focus on continuous improvement of myself in my understanding of philosophy, psychology, skill development, etc. Plenty of great podcasts out there as well. I guess as a podcast host, I have to say that it's part of my contract. <laughs> but leadership at its core, it's about understanding people. For me, becoming a better, more informed human being makes me a better, more informed leader. It's that simple for me. There are two books I'd recommend here just as examples of what I mean by this. Lead Yourself First by Raymond M. Kethledge and Michael S. Irwin and The Courage to be Disliked by Ichiro Kashimi and Fumitaki Koga. And I'll have links to these in the show notes. We play roles in each other's stories. A small impact in your story could be a major turning point in mine. So all the more reason for you to advocate for diverse opinions, recognize your own blind spots and biases, and also to protect mentees. There might be savvy coworkers out there who see them as an opportunity to do work that they don't realize they don't need to be doing as a way to shirk their own responsibilities. 
One last point here. You may find yourself in a situation where you're being asked to mentor someone older than you. Age isn't everything, but it definitely is something. I mean, I think we're hardwired to defer to older people, and it can be awkward for them having to learn from someone younger. You should do this for anyone, but especially in this situation, identify what qualities of that person are admirable or that you aspire to. And my advice here would be to lean into those differences. Try to make it more of a two-way street where they feel valued for their life experience and that they could teach you something while you teach them the practicalities that your situation dictates. Four, maintaining balance. You have to support the current management structure of your organization and and the policies and procedures that are in place. You want to strive also to avoid double standards and how you communicate up versus down. Just be consistent. That means honoring the methods, processes, and history of the company and those who came before you. You want to understand why things are the way they are fully before you start making judgments and changes or recommendations. And teaching is a great way to fully understand this aspect of your business or any aspect of your business. You also, this is a really important point here, especially with mentees, is you want to criticize in private, praise in public. People don't like being called out in a group. So try to avoid that at all costs. But on a more positive note, one of your jobs as a mentor is really to draw a map. The more broad and detailed the map you draw for your mentees is, the easier it's going to be to chart their development path. Now, you want to avoid too much detail where it stifles their capacity to explore along the way, and they may decide along the way to chart a new path or have a different destination in mind. For yourself, resist the urge to appear pristine. Point out when you make mistakes, and be sure to illustrate how things are handled when things go wrong, not just when things go smoothly. You focus on fixing problems both internally and with clients because there's a different skill set involved, and you want to show them all the different ways things can go awry. With your mentee, you do want to assess skill and job imbalances to maximize their engagement and their productivity. Don't just identify if a person's job responsibilities aren't a good match for their skills. Try to assess the needs and weaknesses of your own organization, and if your mentee's talents could help, feel free to point out that connection to your management. There might be a better fit for that person. Remember, though, all of management likely knows of these new employees just by what they remember from the interview process. So they're definitely going to listen when a trusted employee helps identify undercover skills or unseen connections that could assist the company in other places because you're going to be working with them at a depth that they haven't explored yet. Maybe to put this in another way, I mean, oftentimes people are hired to plug a hole in a ship. Whether the ship got bigger or someone has left, these people, they might just be capable of being a lookout to avoid more rocks or maybe they have a knack for building a tighter knit crew. Or eventually they have the capacity to steer the boat for themselves and captain the ship. Right now they're just plugging a hole in the ship. But if you see that they can do so much more, you could find somebody else to plug that hole in the ship in a lot of cases. Remember, everyone's the hero of their own story. So you want to learn each of your mentees' internal narratives. What drives them? What motivated them to take the role or join the company in the first place? What's going to motivate them to stay? What fears do they have about their new role, the company, membership? And there's so many different ways this can change. I mean, someone's motivation could be very different than what you perceive. And giving them the opportunity to share their narrative can really help you be a better mentor. And it's a great way to start building trust and knowledge between each other. And likewise, you want to be mindful of your own internal narratives. What is the importance or lack thereof you place on your mentorship efforts? Also remember, for anybody, starting a new job is going to be filled with a bunch of anxiety. I mean, sure, it's exciting, right? But it can be hard to see ahead in the future, and that would make anybody nervous. So your advice, your teachings, your mentorship can act as a sort of time machine, which lets them see some of those future potentialities, which helps with that anxiety. Or, like I said earlier, it could add details to their map that are going to aid their journey. One tip you could have here is you can consider a sort of mentoring journal or place to keep notes. I mean, you want to be careful here. Avoid cataloging personal information on your mentees. You're just going to look like a creep. But there was this really interesting idea I heard recently about Peter Drucker called feedback analysis. When you're making a decision or you have a feeling of how something might go with a, with a mentee or mentor relationship, write down what you expect to happen as a result of that action. File it away for a few months and then come back and review it. Gauge how reality compares to your expectations at that moment. And that's going to help see your strengths and weaknesses as a mentor, and you can grow from that.
Moving on to uh, my last tip here, number five, meet people halfway. What works for you won't necessarily work for them. Don't overcompensate for their weaknesses. You help when requested, but resist the urge to impose yourself. We each have enough of our own tasks in life. There's no reason to work those belonging to others. You know, knowledge resides in the body and soul as much as the mind. So we have to learn by doing, not just telling. Have mentees work their problems. Face resistance. Sometimes they're going to fall on their face. Resist that urge to help them. You can guide them, but seek out opportunities to challenge them too. I mean, we rarely get perfect situations. So focus on dealing with imperfect ones. And this is why focusing on not just on the how, but the why, can help newbies make appropriate, justifiable decisions. When I was first thrust into managing people, I was thrown to the wolves. I had no training. I was mentored by somebody that had ulterior motives. I was the rube that taken advantage of that I mentioned earlier. But at the same time, I did have the opportunity to learn how to meet people halfway. People don't respect titles for very long. Actions get respected far more than words. And that's something that experience was very valuable at. Because that transition happens a lot faster than you think. Just because you got the fancy new title and responsibilities or people were hired underneath you that you're now in charge of, don't underestimate people's capacity to sniff out bullshit and call you out on it. You can lose the room really quick. So meeting people halfway at their level, understanding their stories, understanding what's important to them and catering to that is just some of the best advice I can give you as you start on your mentorship journey. So once again, I'm going to close an episode of Chris will deal with it with a quote from my boy Seneca. It's one that really gets to a core mindset of mentorship in life and in business. Associate with people who may improve you. Admit people whom you can improve. This process is mutual. Men learn as they teach. Have a great week, everybody. If you feel that Chris dealt with it, I'd appreciate your support of the show by sharing it with someone who might benefit. Ratings on your favorite podcast player are also helpful in growing the audience. Visit chriscroyder.com for free downloadable PDFs with notes and resources for today's episode. Sign up to the CDWI mailing list or to send in your problems or requests for future shows. That's C-H-R-I-S-K-R-E-U-T-E-R.com or use the link in the show notes. Thanks for listening. Crystal Dealer.